and the series is called Where We All Belong. So how did it actually all come about? Well, we're both members of the Community Drug Strategy Committee that is sponsored by the City of Courtney. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one of our monthly meetings, we came up with an idea to make a proposal to Shaw mm -hmm. about doing a one-episode profile about all the work that the Drug Strategy Committee had done. Yes. And so we uh, met with you and, uh -huh. and gave you that information. Mm -hmm. And then, as I recall, you came back and said, no, that's yeah. not going to work. That's right. But we have this idea that all, with all this information you provided, that this would make a really great service, uh, a series. Yeah, that's right. And so we were a little shocked and frightened. <laughs> yeah. But we also got excited because there is a lot of information and there are a lot of services, uh, substance re use related services in the Comox Valley and we would like the community to know about them. When you first offered us that idea, kind of, it, it was kind of a two part shock. It was like, what? And yeah. then, wow. So then we yeah. had to go back and sell it to the Drug Strategy mm -hmm. Committee because mm -hmm. they were worried about how much work it would be yeah and um and it has been a lot of work it has been a lot of <laughs> yes. work but it's yeah. been wonderful mm -hmm. yeah. um to work with everybody um and we've wanted to for uh, many many years talk about the continuum of substance use services so um so you know, what is that exactly uh continuum of substance use yeah. services yeah. well when we say continuum there we mean um you know, there's a range of services that um, are interrelated, um, and even though a person that wants a particular service can enter in to any service that is right for them at that time, if you look at it from least least acute or least serious to most acute or most serious, um, you can line them up in kind of a um, uh, just a, a, a you yeah, know like yeah, a, a yeah. line of. Right. of you know, from prevention services mm -hmm. to, um, you know, education services in school to um, you know, uh, outpatient treatment services to harm reduction services and detox services, mm -hmm. residential services. So all of those things um, exist in, in most communities. And we wanted to highlight the ones that exist in our community. We want to be proactive. We want to have a profile that uh, encourages people to know about these issues and to do what we can to prevent them from getting worse. Yeah, I, I'm the coordinator for the Comox Valley Girls Group, which is run through the Transition Society. And I also am a substance use counselor with youth at the John Howard Society. Really what we try to do is take themes that are connected to um, some of the risk factors for substance use and we explore them often in a really artistic way way. They hear parents that have been coming for weeks or months and, and they start hearing the light at the, or, or hearing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's been a great way to be able to provide a service to the parents while the parents get support from other parents. In a small community we often need creative solutions and we really are good at that at AIDS Vancouver Island. And that's why I really like uh, storytelling as a form of connection, as a form of, if you want to call it therapy, um, because it's, it helps me too. Mm -hmm. I, I am helped by telling you the story. Because we believe that recovery is for everybody. Right. I think our services work because we, we develop all our programming with our clients. We shouldn't be talking about addiction. We should be talking about uh, connection. Mm -hmm. And that's what the recovery center is probably trying to do and is probably best at. And so to have that connection and have that positive rapport, it, it makes it easier for people to return and, and look for, for help. There's also a continuum of use from no problem, no mm -hmm. big deal, right. Mm -hmm. right to um, very, very big deal. Uh, and uh, so, uh, um, I think that the no big deal, um, we don't really, you know, people, they wouldn't probably be accessing our services unless it was prevention services in schools where they might mm -hmm. just find out about, you know, self-esteem, um, you know, uh, making good decisions, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, having uh, you know difficult conversations in in, re in relationships. That kind of, those are prevention things. How do we build resilient people so we have a resilient and a healthy community? So that's that end. Yeah, right. and you can see like from right now, mm -hmm. when you know when you propose uh, having a single story. It was, it's just so big, what's happening yeah. in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like when in our various meetings, um, like your passion, both of you, you know, for, for what you do, and, and, and it was the compassion that you both have and the compassion that you see in the community mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. your services. So I know that's a, an ongoing string in the series. Yes, do you want to talk about that a bit? Very much, yeah. That, that um, often when people are struggling with substance use, they they experience a lot of, of stigma, right. um, uh, and there's a lot of shame about um, substance use and having problems with substances, and so. Um, the services that we have in our community and many of the folks who have worked in these services for years and decades have a deep, deep compassion mm -hmm. for um, the individuals who come into our services. So you, you got to think of the bright side, that, that there's oftentimes the impacts that we make are impacts. That we're not just putting in time, punching a clock, we're dealing with people and sometimes it works out. That's where the real power comes, when women help other women, when they inspire other women, when they see women um, getting clean and sober and finding a place to live and changing their lives. It's, it's pretty magical. This is a person that in their world, it was the end. Their only way out was to kill themselves. and. Now she's more concerned with my life than hers. Um, so we have to recognize that there are different ways of, of educating, different ways of, of helping people with addictions, different ways of, of helping people through whatever life trauma or whatever circumstance they're going through. Just the honesty from, from a lot of the people we deal with is just, it's phenomenal. It's amazing to see them do that. Um, it's hard for them sometimes because they may have done something illegal, but when they do have that chance, it's it's it means a lot to us to be able to have that and, and we remember for the next time. Narcan is just a way of um, saving lives. In our traditions we have many many stories and uh, there are teachings woven into each of the stories that we share in our communities. So anything that was helping the community to treat each other better and again to have, make sure we instill in everybody to try and make sure where everybody does belong. Naloxone can save a life. The more people who know about how to respond to an overdose, the more people who can be saved. You could save a life. And as well, um, compassion for even the other workers because this can be challenging work yeah. and so we wanted to highlight that and also to um, profile that it to, to the viewer so that um, they can understand that when they walk through the door they will be met with a, a, a warm welcome mm -hmm. and that it won't be um, continuing to stigmatize them That's right. and uh, the path, the journey of, of um, recovery, or some people use that word, or just um, making a, a change to your substance use, um, can be uh, a long, or it can be starts and stops and windy road, and which is, normal. Which is very, very yeah. normal, mm -hmm. and that that we understand that, the people mm. who, who work in this field understand that and that the door is always open and you can keep coming back or you can try a different service. If this one doesn't work, there might be something else that's working, would yeah. work better. And I think that's so important mm -hmm. for people that may need a service mm -hmm. to understand that. couldn't really include them no, all and, no. and the revelation for me was I think oh my 
because we really don't have enough services to fill in all the gaps and we really don't have enough staffing in, in mm -hmm. a lot of those services. Um, so we feel that we let people down a lot and the community down a lot. But doing this series, we realize, or I did anyway, just how many different things that we, and services that we work with all the time that we forget, we forget how many. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we couldn't even fit them all into mm -hmm. the series. Right. So um, that, that made me feel really good about our community uh, in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, and so I'm hoping viewers are able to see, wow, mm -hmm. look at that, and, and recognize that there's still a, it seems that once you get some services, it puts a, a light on, it mm -hmm. illuminates what other things aren't there, and then you realize you need other and other and other things mm -hmm. to make it all work in a, in a smooth way. Canada is the second highest per capita consumer of opioids after the US. In the past 10 years, our per capita use has doubled, Related deaths have also doubled and are now twice that of HIV. Our staff are fabulous at creating meaningful um, relationships with people, really working from that person's strengths and really hopefully building on supporting them and having a better life in spite of having chronic pain. We are friendly. Uh, we are fairly easy to access um, and we are really interested in working with people um, on, on what is most important to them. Our focus is generally on safety and whatever that means for the person. I think it's wor working because the people we work with tell us it's working. The potential for recovery is higher when it is a, uh, a recovery based in the community and not just done in isolation. And we got a phone call from someone who's now living on the mainland who wanted us to know and to share that he felt that ERP had saved his life. And he had sent you know, some of his friends along to come to ERP and check it out. The, the root of that is really just about respecting um, another individual and, and honoring what it means to be in relationship with that person. Right, well who did, who did do the music for it? Uh, oh, um, one of, uh, that's the nice thing about all of this. So many local yeah. folks have yes. stood up to the plate and, mm -hmm. and haven't chased me away when I've walked up to them and said hi. And in this case, it was, hi, Jeff Drummond. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know you're amazing, and we're doing this production, and could you, would you consider being our sound person for this? And, and as has been the case all along, almost, well, very little time to, to consider it's yes. Mm -hmm. So we had mm -hmm. a, I think that's been the other, um, um, we hear a lot of no in our work. Mm -hmm. And doing this series, it was yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And technically, uh, this couldn't have been done without Steve Ray. Steve yeah. Ray, Steve, Steve yes. Ray over there. Yeah, Steve is shooting this um, right now. So. He is like a miracle man with a camera. Uh, and But not only that. No. Mr. Perfectionism, mm -hmm. which is really important to have something mm -hmm. that looks good at the end. Yeah. And so, and you too, Chaz, yeah. the two yeah. of you have been the inspiration that I mm -hmm. think a big part of what's kept Sarah and I going because a lot of late nights, a lot of vacation days, a lot of mm -hmm. weekends, mm -hmm. uh, and you've just been so supportive and um, engaged with this topic. And we're not used to that. And you both connected us with other people who could help provide the technical um, knowledge and the back, all the background. You know, mm -hmm. Steve connected us with the, the, the camera club. That's right. oh, so many, many of the volunteers helped assist with the filming. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, provided some other staff from mm -hmm. Shaw for mm -hmm. a lot of the filming. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was so much in the background that was completely out of Sam and my, uh, my uh, scope of knowledge. Yeah. So we came with the idea and the, the passion for it. And we had the, um, the colleagues that were working in the services, the connections there, but we didn't have the, 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 the knowledge or the, the to, to put it, to yeah. how do you make yeah. it happen? Yes. How do you get it on film and make yeah. it look good? Yeah. So it's, it's been, uh, we could never have reached a final product without um, your and Steve's 
technical support and, yeah, well, and you know, commitment. Shaw TV, you know, it's yeah. access yes, and yes, you know, it's community Shaw television. TV. So, Steve, um, you've been the uh, the magician who's actually helped us take our, our ideas and get it on film. And so, what would what, what was this experience like for you for filming this and working on it for the last year? Uh, it's been great. Um, a lot of the things I normally do are pretty straightforward. Whether it's like going down to jazz concerts and taping, or going interviewing somebody for Shaw TV for a, for a program. But in this case, I had a chance to sort of create this little sort of drama that uh, was part of the interacting that the, the uh, people had to help illustrate the fact of our two participants, our two ghosts, that are going to be in our drama. So it was kind of interesting that way because I had to come up with something creative, something a little different than just shooting a, a, a preset interview and the rest of the things. So it was kind of a nice challenge to come up with creative images. How are we going to shoot at night? It's perf It's cold, you know, how are we going to light up half of the 5th Street Bridge and then uh, down on a grassy uh, sidewalk or something like this. So, yeah, it was a real, real challenge to come up with something interesting. So we often, uh, um, I think I was really um, taken with how much patience you have because you'd set up something so perfectly and everything would be a go and everyone's ready to do it and then a bicycle would drive by or uh, a plane would mm -hmm. go by or and then it, you would I, I could see you take a little breath and go okay and again and so I was always amazed at how much patience you had and your willingness to make it um, a good end product and that kept all of us that kept all of us uh, um, wanting to try and so that your your involvement was so it was more than just camera and magic it was you you also brought that that i don't know you, you had that smile on your face all the time <laughs> well every production that you do is different but i mean especially when you're doing things outside that there's a lot of things that can go wrong murphy's law about you know what's going to work and what isn't going to work but luckily we had a good sized crew uh, but even then can't stop things you know if somebody a bicycle goes by in the back of the shot so you have to stop or a plane flies through and you know and the noise is picked up but we had a lot of other people who were, that, that, that really helped out so we had people you know brushing leaves off the pathway we had people that brought a kitchen uh, uh, or provided food for us and had a trailer set up so when we're freezing there on a November night you know everybody can do their part to to putting it all together and that's what it really is it's all teamwork you know it's not one individual it's everybody doing something I mean, great episodes with the script girl, you know, slate girl who had to hold up the slate and yet her dad was also one of the ghosts. So we had lots of fun on the set and everybody enjoyed themselves and had a good time and that's really what's good about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated um, your openness to, to some of the younger members of our crews um, and how much they learned and how quickly they learned it and you were, very, uh, you were a very good teacher. So. Well, you know, I was a teacher before I'm retired now doing all this stuff and uh, I really enjoy helping people so it's great uh, being out there and having the experience I mean I get so much out of it by helping other people by having people who want to learn who want to absorb knowledge like sponges and everybody had a great time so people learned a little bit about lighting and they enjoyed themselves and what it was like traipsing through wet leaves and setting how to use this microphone and all the kinds of things so that's the whole thing as long as people are having a positive environment everybody learns from everything that they do so no matter what you pick up in life it's always going to be of some value to you so as long as people enjoyed themselves had a good time and uh, everything worked out. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine a, a compassionate community that uh, its members work collaboratively together to help and support and care for um, the members that are less fortunate than, say, myself, um, and and really strive to um, help alleviate or, or lessen people's pain and suffering. I think a compassionate community is where people in the community come together and they help one another out. So when we have lots of 
uh, issues in our community with substance abuse, alcohol abuse, gambling. Uh, a compassionate community is where people step forward and put their hand out and give a helping hand to folks that are in need. It doesn't hate people that have problems with drug abuse, I would say, for sure. Um, has uh, facilities and programs that can help people. Community of understanding everyone within it and uh, non-judgmental. Taking the stigma out of mental health. You know, like I, I personally have walked into mental health looking for help and I found it. A passionate community, is a community for me is a community that makes sure that no one is left behind, that everybody has a, an equal opportunity to succeed and to have a healthy lifestyle. Um, there, are, there are losses that can happen through addiction and mm -hmm. the ghost is a, a kind of a dramatic element that symbolizes how like addiction is often hidden in our society in our communities right. and so the the story of the 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 two individuals is a, a, a way for us to um, invite our viewers into learning more about uh, the addiction services in the Comox Valley Hey, can you see me? Yeah, can you see me? Someone walked right through me back there. Yeah, I, I think in the park I saw my body. We might be dead. 
Are we ghosts? How could I have done something like this to myself? What was I thinking? I know, I was thinking I could have done something different too. I wish I could have talked to somebody. I, I think there are places that we could have went. Can you show me? Sure. The ghosts uh, travel further. Uh, will we see more of the ghosts? Mm -hmm, yeah, and, and in fact, often recovery is a bit of a journey. So we have the, um, we were able to use the, the, the concept of the ghost um, to do a bit of a walkabout to key services, and, and they're all key services, but the ones that are most specifically uh, um, providing substance use service. Uh, and so they've gone on this journey, and they actually become the eyes of the viewer.